David's going to come read for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you until the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Father Paul, by the Spirit, gives thanks for the grace we are given in Christ, for he is the author of all mercy. As Ken preaches the gospel, open our eyes to see the glory of Christ and the blessing we have in him. Amen. Thanksgiving. Are we always thankful? If we say so, we're probably lying because we know our hearts. So many times when we face troubles and difficulties, afflictions and trials, the last thing that comes to our mind is being thankful. And yet, that's what the scriptures instruct us to do, that in all things give thanks because God's worthy of it. And I believe the more we understand how everything that comes to pass in our lives is according to God's will, not just that he sees it, but he orders it, designs it, directs it, as much as if you were to go into a dress shop or a suit shop and get fit for an outfit or whatever. I'm not going to go in and get fit for a dress, but a suit that it's designed for you. And the Lord has helped me over the years to see that as I've been through a number of afflictions and difficulties and trials and tribulations and stared death in the face. And yet all of that, the Lord has made me to see that it's all from his hand. And therefore, we're to give thanks. And that's really what we find here with the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians. That's how he begins this epistle to them. And I've entitled this message, A Prayer of Thanksgiving. The extended thanksgiving here in verses 4 through 9 that we just read really captures Paul's profound gratitude to God. Many times when he was writing from prison, just like we read in Philippians, you have to realize he was in prison when he wrote to the Philippians and said, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. You don't find one mention in there of complaint about his circumstances, but that the Lord by his grace, gave him that heart to give thanks and to be thankful. And that's really what is the foundation of all true grace. You don't just drum this up or tell yourself, okay, I got to be thankful. That'll last about a millisecond until the next thought comes in and just brings you down. It's the grace of God. The same grace, remember the scriptures say of Christ that he was full of grace and truth. Think of what he endured as God in the flesh, the contradiction of sinners against himself. No man has ever suffered as Christ suffered as a man. And yet we find him always giving thanks to his father. Every time one of his prayers is recorded, he is thanking God, and asking God to glorify him with the glory that he had with the father even before the world began. And so that's the foundation of true thanksgiving. So I'm not going to, at the end of this message, have you write down a little note cards, different ways that you know you can be thankful and give you a project and all these things you hear people doing. You might as well just go ahead and wad them up and throw them in the trash because that's not how it's done. No more so than when people say, put me on your prayer list. No, there's no prayer list. It's not like you spin the wheel and see what comes up. We remember different ones as the Lord brings them to mind. That's true prayer because it's from the heart. And so it is with thanksgiving. Here in our translation in uh, verses four through nine, 
there are actually six different sentences, if you see how it's broken down there, by verses. But when you go back to the Greek, the paragraph is structured around two main clauses. It's one of the things I love about going back and looking up in the Greek, having studied it. The structure's different. That's why sometimes it's difficult to translate from Greek to English or Hebrew to English because the structure's different. They don't put the words in the same order. In Greek, the emphasis of a particular phrase or paragraph is put right at the beginning. So if it's there, you know that's the point that is being made. And here, if you'll underscore it, you'll see it. In verse 4, for example, what does he say? I thank my God. So that's the first structure or clause on which the rest hangs when you read on down through there everything has to do with that thanking God in everything being rich by him and goes on down all the way to verse 8 and then the second clause that stands out is in verse 9 God is faithful so that sums up really what a prayer of thanksgiving is. It's thanking God. That's the first clause on which all thanksgiving hangs. And then as if to sum it all up, why is it that we thank God? He is faithful. He's faithful even when we're not. His love, his grace toward his children is unconditional. Why? Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't think it's because you've done anything and you got up on the right side of the bed and things are going well, that somehow that's why God is to be thanked. Now, he's faithful even when we are not. And so in verses 4 to 9, this is the first part I want us to see here, this prayer of thanksgiving. When Paul says, I thank my God, what? Always concerning you or on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you, but how is grace given? By Jesus Christ. That's the only way that God can ever be gracious to a sinner. It is by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But that his thanksgiving here to these Corinthians that he's writing is that they be enriched in everything. But notice again, by him. It's not just being enriched, but by him. This is what it is to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you grow in grace. It's by the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The more you learn of him by his spirit, the more you grow in grace. If you're growing in grace, you're growing in your need of grace. That means the more you learn of him, the more you see your need. You're not getting better and better. But, oh, how I need that grace more today than I ever did. And this is what Paul is writing to them so that they don't come short in any gift. Think of a gift, any gift with regard to what God is pleased to give them and eagerly awaiting the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, who will confirm you to the end. You see that in verse eight? This is all, all these are linked to, I thank God. And that we be found in him, what does he say? Blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. How is any sinner expect to be found blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's only going to be through his finished work. It's only going to be through what he came and worked out. Paul said, if righteousness came in any other way, then Christ is dead in vain. You see why we need to hear of Christ more and more, his death and what he accomplished? Because... Any, any blamelessness will be because of what he did and what he's accomplished. And therefore, Paul says God's faithful. That's really the base of any thanksgiving. I thank God he's faithful. Faithful to his son. You know, when John wrote there, if we confess our sins in 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The sense there is continue to forgive us why? Because forgiveness of sins was accomplished at the cross. 
But who is God faithful and just to? We like to think, well, that's me. He's faithful and just. No, he's faithful and just to his son. And as beneficiaries, that's who we are, beneficiaries of what Christ accomplished. Therefore, we benefit from that faithfulness to his son. And it's son to, notice verse 9, that fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we're called. By whom ye were called under the fellowship of his son. We use that word fellowship pretty loosely, don't we? It usually means sitting around the table and at least have food and chit chat. We're having fellowship. Now, this is fellowship right here, where we're gathered around the table, but it's the table of the Lord. He's the bread of life, He's the water of life. And we're learning of Him. And would that our conversation, even when we get up and separate that it always be around who we are in the lord jesus christ and who he is what he's accomplished that's a subject we can never exhaust sometimes you'll sit with people and they'll entertain a subject and then everybody gets quiet it's like well i guess we wore that subject out now we'll go on to another but you can never wear this one out as far as who christ is that's why i like those five questions there if you get thinking well i don't know if we can talk any more about who he is well let's go on to what he accomplished and who he came for, why he did it, and where he is now. All of these things are what is the foundation of our thanksgiving. So Paul says, I thank my God always. That's the first clause up there. Now, it's interesting as we read on and study on in 1 Corinthians, Paul is going to have to deal with a lot of problems. That's why he's writing the letter. There were a lot of issues going on, Pop, pe preacher popularity, a man having his father's wife, arguing and debating over gifts. I mean, there was just, it was, it was turmoil. And you're saying, this was the Lord's church? Yep. Why? Because Christ came to save sinners of whom I'm chief. And I believe that wherever the Lord gathers his people, Yes, we seek peace and calm and getting along and all that, but it's still sinners gathered together. And so there is going to be trouble amongst those that claim to be the Lord's. What's it going to take? It's going to take the grace of God to continue to keep us together and praying for one another. And so Paul has all this in mind as he begins this epistle. They don't know what he's going to say. This sounds pretty good so far. And I'm sure some of them reading it think, oh, well, maybe he's not going to deal with the, the real problem. I remember that growing up. Whenever I had to get a spanking from my dad, he'd come in, sit down, first of all, talk to me. And he didn't like to spank me angry. And so while he's sitting there talking to me, I'm thinking, well, maybe this is going to go than what I thought. You know, I love you, son. And I just want you to know I care for you. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, this is going well. And then all of a sudden, it's okay. Come over here and get, lean over my knee. And it was like, okay, got to the point. And that's really what it was with Paul here. He's, he's not, he's commending them to the Lord. He's thanking them genuinely because they are the Lord's. And yet, he's going to tenderly have to tell them some things that they don't want to hear. That's one of the tough parts about being a under shepherd of the Lord's sheep is to, we need to speak the truth, do it in love, but there's times it has to be spoken very firmly. And yet, always with thanksgiving, that if any are the Lord's, he's faithful, and he's the one that will direct each one, and whom the Lord, Lord loves, he chastens. So here, Paul's subject of thanks, when he says, I thank God always, come back here to my text, in verse 4, for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. I can't think of any better reason to thank the Lord for others that are his than for that grace which has been given them by Jesus Christ. Notice, given. Grace is free. And you say, well, why you would you even need to say that. Well, it's because people mix it up. You know, they think of grace as being something they have deserved. 
or merit somehow. No, it's free and it's freely given. But it's freely given by Jesus Christ. He's the mediator and uh, he's the finisher, the author and finisher of it. He's the executor of it. It's because of his death that grace can even be given. Think of what he gave himself in order for God to be gracious unto such as we are. So this was the specific reason for Paul's gratitude. Everything good that there was among these Corinthian believers of this congregation came from God. Paul's not patting any one of them on the back and saying, well, this one's a little better than that one. You're doing pretty good. No, he sums it all up here in the truth that if any are the Lord's, that grace that was given to them was what it is, the grace of God. And it's by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what grace means. I like the acronym grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. There's some today that try to argue that God has some kind of common grace for everybody. No. Now, his mercy is over all of his creation. The word mercy simply means God withholding what we deserve. And there's a sense in which God withholds judgment, even amongst the unconverted and the reprobates, does not bring that judgment on them immediately. That's mercy. But when it comes to grace, there's no such thing as common grace. If you see that term anywhere in writing, just cross through it. There's only one kind of grace. That's God's grace by Jesus Christ to those that the Father gave to the Son. And uh, that's what Paul here is thanking God for. That grace, it's a special grace according to his purpose alone. And it only pertains to those for whom Christ paid the debt. If God had purposed grace for every single person, every single person would be saved because Christ came to lay down his life for those that the Father gave him. And that's where we see a distinction. You can argue all you want to against it, but the reality is the only reason any are objects of God's grace is because God purposed it, chose them out. I didn't become a child of God by my own intellect or seeking or yearning or study or all these things. No, it's by the grace of God. So it's grace that has been given to those at the Father's purpose by Jesus Christ. And then look at that as a result, enriched in everything by him. So you can't even say, well, I got the grace to get started, but now the rest I'm running on my own fuel now. No. Verse five, that in everything, is there a reason why Paul keeps using always everything? It's to leave no doubt that this is all of the Lord, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. See, he's getting ready to have to address just in the rest of this chapter about the church being divided between this preacher and that preacher, even some not getting along amongst themselves. He's heard these things. And what is it that is the cause of division in a body? It's jealousy. It's one worm lifting its head above the other and thinking he's a little better than the other. You ever see worms kind of mingling? There's always one trying to get on top of the other and get higher, push the other one down. I don't spend a lot of time watching worms, but they are interesting if you haven't got anything else to do. <laughs> the other day, bought some fishing worms and digging around in the soil, you know, you put your finger in there and boy, they're just squirming around. That's all we are. Nothing but worms. And we are what we are by the grace of God, but enriched in everything. Look at even how that word is put. We didn't earn this. We're enriched by inheritance. That means it's been given to us. Anything we have with regard to God or Christ, it's because we have been enriched. 
We didn't earn it. And that's the effect then of the grace of God in the hearts of sinners, even as these Corinthians that the Lord had saved by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Paul's reminding them, you don't need to be arguing over what you have versus what the other has. If this one has this utterance, and he's, I like him better than that one. That's what he's going to get to. Because we're all enriched. We all share the same enrichment in Christ. And therefore are a rich church, not materially, but in speech and knowledge, any utterance, that's what he talks about there, doesn't he? That we're able to speak of, I don't care who it is, whether I'm speaking or one of the men comes up here, reads scripture and makes some comments, each of us enriched, we've been blessed to be able to speak and give utterance unto the Lord in all things to the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's really who it's about. You see that in verse six, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Oh, what a joy to be able to hear some maybe more feebly than others, some more boldly, some more articulately with than others, but still speaking of Christ, my ears perk up. Could be sitting around a table and someone down there just talking quietly about what the Lord's teaching them. I, I want to get close. I want to find out. I want to hear. Because I love to hear of the testimony of Christ in the heart of another one of his children. That rejoices my heart. And that's the way it ought to be. Not worried about how we say it or how it comes out. Any utterance that we have is going to be because of being enriched in him. And... Uh, to come short, as Paul says, in no gift. Every gift, we've all been gifted to serve the Lord where we are. We're not organizing this and trying to get committees set up and people working and doing all. No, each one exercising that gift that the Lord has encouraged them to do. I love it when I find out that they didn't have to come through me. Somebody went and visited one of our congregants that was sick. You know, didn't have to ask me, didn't have to organize it, sent, sent some flowers, sent a gift, made a meal. All things as the Lord directs, a little note. Those are things that each one does according as the Lord pick up the phone. These things don't have to be organized, but there's that caring one for another that no one comes short in any gift. I hear a number of people tell me that I could never do what you do. Well, the Lord didn't equip you to do it, so don't try. But I know looking around, there's a lot of things that you do I couldn't do. And so I'm thankful that you're doing what the Lord has given you to do. As we all, you can see together in verse 7, await for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming again. He's coming in our lifetime. He'll either come and take us out in death or he'll come as the scriptures say, we'll see him in clouds of glory. But either way, he's coming. And so what do we do? Occupy till he comes. We're not sitting around trying to speculate when, where, and how. We don't know. But we're to be about serving him today according to the gift that he has given us by the grace of God and because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Christ said, even in as the Father has sent me, said that to his disciples, even so send I you. And I just love to hear your testimonies. Different ones come in, sit down and talk to him about different ones they were able to talk to this week and never dreamed at, at work or whatever. All of a sudden this conversation breaks out and you're talking about Christ. And then you're looking for you know, a brochure to give them or a link to send them. All of these things, that's the Lord working as we, as it says there, we await for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that word waiting, I would say means eagerly awaiting. Have you ever known that somebody's going to come for a visit and you keep asking, 
You know, if you're a kid, it's like, is it today? Eagerly awaiting. That's the sense here with which we await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so that we come short in no gift. And so that's what Paul is doing here. He's thanking God for the gifts among these uh, Corinthians, even though there were those causing trouble. You know, trouble could be for one or two reasons. Either there's a, an immature member of the body that is acting out and creating trouble, or you have to recognize too that many times there's trouble in the congregation because some that are there aren't even the Lord's. And they're not at peace. And they don't like other people to at peace. So they're going to be stirring things up. Could be in their family. Could be in the congregation. Whatever it is. But I know this. That if they are the Lord's. It's the Lord that's going to deal with them. And sometimes it's hard to know. When to, when to talk and speak. And when to be silent. As you wait on the Lord. Because particularly an under shepherd. Hears a lot more than what most other people hear. And I strive to protect the congregation. I, I strive to protect different sheep, not wanting them to become involved in controversy that's all around. And so many times the preacher will silently take those things on, prayerfully consider when is it that he has to speak and address the issue. and Maybe not. Sometimes in time it all goes away. The Lord deals with it, takes care of it. But in all things, we're not to come short in any gift which the Lord has given to us. And here, as he said in uh, verse 6, to confirm them, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. You know how the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you? It's that no matter what the trial, the trouble, the difficulty, nothing is going to take you out of Christ. You continue to look to him and regardless of your weakness, regardless of your failings, regardless of how many times you fall, you're continuing to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. He keeps those that are his and for whom he's paid the debt. He said that I'll not lose one. I don't know about you, but that's good news to Ken Weimer because I'd be the first one to wander off and get lost. I remember back when we'd travel with my family and I was younger, my dad was always up ahead. He had a fast, fast pace, and my sister was always tagging ahead with him. And then my mom was caught in the middle because I was back dragging my feet, trying everything. If it was a button to push, I was going to push it. If it was a bench, I was looking under it, see what I could do with it. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I heard, come on, Kenny, come on, Kenny. But I'm thankful with regard to my salvation that I can never be lost, that the Lord has already drawn me to himself and carried me on his shoulders to the fold. And that no matter the test or trial, I can't wander from him because he's going to keep me. That's, that's what Paul is confident of here when he says that Christ, the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Some people ask, well, how do we know if so-and-so? They're always looking about so-and-so rather than themselves. How, how do we know so-and-so is the Lord's, you know? Well, see me in 25 years. Because if they are, you're going to find them still following Christ. But the better question is, how do you know you're the Lord's? See me in 25 years. And I pray that in 25 years, you'll find me exactly as I am right now, following after Christ and looking to him. I'm as amazed as anybody that the Lord has kept me all these years. I thank him. That's the only testimony I have confirmed in him. When it pleased him to reveal himself in me, I had no clue what was ahead. And yet here I am, continuing to preach as he gives utterance. But that's all his work. Him confirming unto the end 
that which he has begun. Faithful is he that calleth you, is what he wrote to the Philippians, who also will do it. And it's all in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In these first 10 verses here, I know we hadn't read down to verse 10, but from verse 1 all the way down to verse 10, Paul refers to the Lord Jesus Christ in every verse. If you like to underline like I do, go back and check it. Jesus Christ, Christ, Christ Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Every verse, he mentions him a total of 11 times. Is there any question then what his emphasis is? And that's how the Lord has persuaded me even with regard to preaching the gospel. You can't preach the gospel and not preach Christ and who he is and what he accomplished. He is the gospel. I hear people trying to define the gospel by this doctrine or that doctrine, and they're waxing eloquent. No, it's Christ. You miss Christ, you missed it all. And everything else falls in line with him. So in this emphasis on the Lord Jesus, that's what Paul is doing here and continues to do as he will address the problems that we're going to look at in the Corinthian congregation. And I am persuaded, as the Lord has taught me over the years, that the, the way to deal with problems in the congregation is not to say, okay, this week we're going to talk about bitterness. Okay, next week we're going to talk about jealousy. Okay, so next week we're going to study about getting along and being friendly. Oh, no. Preach Christ and him crucified. And those that are the Lord's, they'll hear his voice. And they'll follow him. And uh, don't you think the shepherd is the best one to be able to line the sheep up? <laughs> the sheep hear my voice and what they follow me. Most preachers that are really hirelings, they're trying to drive the sheep. That's not what the Lord does. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they what follow. He's leading his sheep. That's where our eyes need to be on him. And so when we get our eyes off of him, it's like a preacher said one time, be careful of following the tail end of the sheep in front of you because you don't know where he's going. You just look for the shepherd. Don't be sheep followers, but Christ followers. And so to wrap this up here, there's a second point. We've seen how in all things give thanks. But I noticed in reading here as well different perspectives or looks with regard to giving thanks and I hope you find this helpful there are five that I would note here first is the upward look and it emphasizes where it is we look in our thanksgiving when Paul says I thank my God always where's God he's seated in the heavens he's seated on the throne and so paul starts off here just like he does in his other epistles with this theme of thanksgiving but where do we look in giving thanks we're not worried about whether anybody else hears us or not but we're looking godward i thank my god always and i believe that's vital when it comes to this matter of giving thanks. If you're not thankful, just take the word and begin to read and consider who God is, how gracious and merciful he is, and how he reveals himself here in his word. And I'll tell you, it won't take long before your heart will be lifted up. Godward. See, that's the upward look, if you will. That's what Paul wrote to the Colossians when he said, set your affection. He didn't say affections. In Colossians 3, 2, set your affection on things above. Where what? Christ is seated. Why is he seated? The work's been finished. So everything pertaining to God is through his son. But that's that upward look. And that's where Paul calls upon these to look even as he is that it is to God alone the upward look secondly 
there is the outward look. And I say that when he says here, concerning you, I thank my God always, here it says, on your behalf, but that means concerning you. So thanksgiving, it's not like the Pharisee that stood in the temple and thanked God that he wasn't like that publican. That's not thanksgiving. That's just pride. Well, I'm sure I'm glad I'm not like that other one. But here, thanking God concerning you so that if we have a heart of thankfulness, it is also looking outward from ourself. We're not just thanking him for our own blessings, but for others. And so Paul has a lot to say to them, even though he's going to say a lot about correction. He's speaking the truth in love. It's because he's thankful for them. If you're thankful for somebody, then you're concerned for them and you speak the truth to them in love. If you're, it's not anybody that you even have any care for, you're not going to stop speaking to them. You just keep going. But here we're speaking particularly of those that are the Lord's. This is our family right here. This congregation has been my family now for all these years, even ab above my own physical family. I've had aunts, uncles, other people that have passed on. I've, I've never left to go to their funerals or visit them or whatever. But here, this is my family. When one sorrows, we all sorrow. That's, that's the, the outward look, the thanksgiving. I thank God, he says here, on your behalf concerning you. And I rejoice. I don't have a prayer list, but every... Once in a while, the Lord brings somebody to mind. I don't know why or what's going on, but that's the time just to thank the Lord, address, and ask the Lord to be with them. So there's that outward look that is the effect of the union that we enjoy in Christ Jesus and the fellowship that we enjoy in that mutual bond of Christ. How can you not be thankful for others that the Lord has bought and brought. But thirdly, yes, you've got the upward look, the outward look, you have the inward look, because this matter of giving thanks is produced from the heart of the grace of God. So that would be the inward look, considering the source. And that's what he says here, I thank God always on your behalf, for the grace of God. So there he's looking inward and acknowledging that any thanksgiving is going to be the fruit of God's grace flowing in by and through him as one of the Lord's and then out toward others. Grace is a divine favor, as I said. It's particular to his children. And so... Even here when he's speaking of the grace of God in verse 4, he's not just talking about a doctrine or a teaching, but he's talking about the very power of God. The grace of God, which is the power of God unto salvation. That's the very working of God's spirit within his children, not just a doctrine, but the very enabling by the Spirit of God through Christ for one to be able to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is, there is that inward look as you're giving thanks. You acknowledge that it's, it's coming from the grace of God. But fourthly, there's a backward look. And here he says, for the grace of God which is given you, and the sense there is was given you. It was given you at some point. That's why I love when I run into some that are the Lord's to go back and ask them, how did the Lord begin to teach you? I listen. Because even though we all come from different backgrounds, the, the Lord does not teach us differently. He's going to show us our sinfulness we're going to acknowledge that we were lost and that he's the one that found us and all the glory 
is going to be to him. I'm not asking for date, time. That's always something in religion, you know. Can you name the place? Or No. All I know is it's like a baby. Doesn't know when it was conceived. But as it's born and comes into the world, it acknowledges that he had nothing to do with it. He grows based on that life that was in that conception. And he had nothing to do with it. And so it is with us. Looking backward to their conversion. The grace which was given you, if one is the Lord's, yes, there will be a time. I don't believe anybody's just going to wake up in glory one day and find out they were an elect. No, this grace that is given is to know Christ, but when it's all said and done, it has to be said that it was the Lord's all along in every way. There's no place for pride. And because of that, and that's really what Paul is building up to in the rest of the epistle here, no, no allowance for division, no personal merit, and uh, certainly no reliance on anything in us. So the grace which was given you, it's good to think back, look back. We don't dwell there. I can remember as the Lord showed me I was lost, and as precious as that, time was but as difficult as it was because he had me in a dark hole for three and a half months trying to preach and couldn't couldn't didn't even know if I was the Lord's or not until he gave me some peace and quiet and light but looking back now I thank him for his grace that drew me to him and made me what I am today and then the final look the fifth is the onward look, what I would call the onward look to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> because he says here in verse four, the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. Beginning to end, it doesn't matter. It's always about the Lord Jesus Christ. Every spiritual blessing flows to us through the Lord Jesus Christ by him. He's both the gift and the giver. He's the unspeakable gift, but he's the giver. He's the savior. And uh, therefore, in every way, we owe him our life and our being. So this thanksgiving clearly is founded upon and through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't know Christ. You don't know really what thanksgiving is or what it is to give. It's just going through the motion. But here, Paul clearly puts the emphasis on the importance of Christ, knowing him, of Christ's relationship to his father. He realized we're just beneficiaries. All this was done between the father and the son. And we were named by his grace as heirs in his will. That's the only reason that we even know him. And so the father could be said as the source of all grace but the son is the means through which every grace is given and the spirit is the revealer of it how do i know that i'm the lord's how do i know that christ paid my sin debt my name isn't written in here in fact the only place i found my name is amongst the old canaanites that were condemned the kenites so i think well that's pretty good that's about where i ought to be but thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ who took all that on himself and uh, paid the sin debt. And my hope is in him if, be, because of the spirit and because of the word. And uh, in him I rest. I hope that's helpful. A prayer of thanksgiving. I, I was blessed in preparing it.